It's time to get your news on. We are VK1 WIA. And getting it on for the last time in 2023, I'm Graham VK4BB. It is the national news for week commencing December 31, 2023. And, wow, we get an extra day this year. Last week I signed off by saying that it was the last broadcast of the year. Now I'm told today is the last day of the year, so today is the last broadcast and we've gained a day. Now this week... WIA Director Stephen Green, VK2TSG. Wallace Institute of Australia Technical Advisory Committee Chairman Grant, VK5GR+. Plus, much, much more in this edition of news from your Wireless Institute of Australia. I'm Editor Graham, VK4 Baker Baker. This is VK1 WIA. All points of contacts from today's news stories are to be found in print when you read the web editions, www.wia.org.au. Hello, this is one of your National WIA Directors, Stephen Green, VK2TSG, with the final 2023 board comment this New Year's Eve. Not only do we have the new year to contend with as we move into 2024, but here in Australia and its territories, we also have the new class licensing arrangement starting from the 19th of February. This will include a revised qualifications framework, new call sign arrangements, the ACMA managing qualifications and call sign services, as well as accrediting examiners. Further details will be available on the WIA website. Although there were reservations held over class licensing, the WIA has worked closely with the ACMA to ensure that amateurs retain equivalent privileges, and we thank the ACMA for their efforts. As a volunteer organisation, member contribution to our activities is essential and we are presently seeking expressions of interest for several roles, including Digital Modes Advisor, QSL Volunteers, Applications Developers, and Graphics or Web Designers. I myself recently attended the Amateur Radio New South Wales site at Dural. They had requested additional people for their broadcast roster. Although I tend to have limited time, I'm looking forward to helping out where possible to try and ease the load for this hard-working and dedicated team. Even if you are far away, differently abled or unsure how you could help, get in touch with the WIA, your state or territory's amateur radio group, or affiliated club to see what you can do. Often the experience you gain in these roles can help towards furthering your prospects and interests. And if you can't contribute directly, why not see if there are a few people close by that you could bring into amateur radio? We are looking forward to seeing attendees at the WIA AGM in May 2024 in Bundaberg, Queensland. Here I'll be presenting a short talk on what I've learned in brief from the prepping community here in Australia, and I must say thank you to those who offered constructive feedback recently on my last broadcast news on the topic, making some corrections that were quite helpful. Lastly, tomorrow is a special day for my family, with my grandmother Dulcie celebrating her 106th birthday. You heard that right, 106. Although not an amateur, Dulcie wound thousands of coils for AWA aircraft radios as part of their work in World War II and has many fond memories of the contributions of wireless in her lifetime. This leads me to wonder what radio stories all of your families may have to share. Happy birthday, Dulcie. This has been Stephen Green, VK2TSG, closing board comments for 2023. Until next time, 73 and Happy New Year. Good morning all from Grant, VK5GR, your new Wireless Institute of Australia Technical Advisory Committee Chairman. Firstly, I wanted to say thanks to the WIA board for accepting my nomination. I also wish to acknowledge the many years of work put into this role by my predecessor, John Martin, VK3KM, who was one of my very early amateur radio mentors, and now is sadly a silent key. Hopefully I can fill his very big shoes. I also wish to thank several of the departing TAC committee members for their contributions over the years, including Rex, VK7MO, Wally, VK6KZ, Barry, VK2AAB, and Peter, VK3 Papa Fox. They are now seeking to retire from the committee and are opening the way for new blood to join the team. Thank you all for your efforts over many years. Now, to start the process of replenishing the team, we wish to welcome Hayden, VK7HH, who will take over the VK7 regional representative, as well as Kevin, VK4UH, who is taking on the microwave advisory role. After a further review of the committee structure and responsibilities, other roles will be opened in the coming months. Stay tuned for more details. Next up, with 2024 almost upon us, it is time to consider the current issues before the TAC. One of the early projects we've identified was a need to update several of the band plans. 
following several recent regulatory changes. The bands we studied, studied included 6 metres, following standard grade licensees getting access to the entire band, 9 centimetres, or 3.4 gigahertz, following the complete withdrawal of 3400 to 3600 megahertz from the amateur service in populated parts of Australia, and 70 centimetres, where some clarifications have been proposed for repeater station allocations. In order to develop appropriate changes, the TAC has prepared a consultation paper which is accessible via the WAA News website. The paper discusses proposals for each band and welcomes feedback on these from all licensed amateur radio operators. We encourage you to take the time to read the paper, consider the impacts on your activities and share your feedback. The closing date for this submission is the 31st of January 2024. We look forward to hearing from you. Well that's all from me this week. 73 is from Grant VK5GR for the WAA Technical Advisory Committee. From here, there and everywhere, you've tuned to the Wireless Institute of Australia's National News Service. We are VK1 WIA. Now with international news, Jason, VK2LAW. Hello, Eid News from Region 1, Jamie. FPV drones are a signature weapon of the Ukraine conflict and jammers to stop them are a matter of life and death. Both sides have fielded jammers and drone guns firing beams of radio waves to knock out drone communications. These jammers are said to take out thousands, yes thousands, of drones a month. Now a Russian group claims to have developed a magic radio for FPVs which is highly resistant to jamming. A physicist with the handle Daniel R evaluated the device minutely in a detailed Twitter thread. From a technological perspective, there's nothing surprising here, Daniel R said, but the device does make efficient use of cheap off-the-shelf components. Racing quadcopters converted into cheap kamikaze drones are used by both sides. They're capable of diving into foxholes and bunkers, chasing down trucks and even destroying main battle tanks from five or more miles away. Often jamming is the only protection, but this device claims to nullify it. To news from Region 2, status of CQ magazine. ARRL has heard from many members concerned about their print subscriptions to CQ magazine. CQ magazine is not an ARRL publication, However, ARRL members enjoy the ability to pursue earning the CQ Worked All Zones and Worked All Prefixes Award through Logbook of the World. CQ editor Rich Moseson, Whiskey 2 Victor Uniform, acknowledged the delays in delivering CQ magazine. He indicated that the November and December issues are delayed, but plans are to get them out to the readership as soon as circumstances permit. However, in another message circulating on some mailing lists, a reply to an inquiry explained that due to funding issues, they've temporarily suspended publication at this time. Our apologies for this inconvenience, and we hope to be back up and running soon. It's unknown exactly what funding issues the magazine has encountered, but CQ Communications Incorporated has discontinued other publications within their operation over the last few years. CQDATV ceased its free online publication in 2021. CQVHF ceased publication in 2013, along with Popular Communications magazine, and merged with World Radio into an online digital publication in 2014. While it is Santa Claus who delivers toys to good boys and girls around the world on Christmas Eve, and is even tracked by NORAD each year, the United States Air Force also does its part to provide goods to islanders throughout Micronesia as part of what is now the Pentagon's longest-running humanitarian airlift operation. The tradition began during the Christmas season in 1952 when a B-29 Super Fortress aircrew saw islanders waving at them from the island of Kapinga Mangarai, 3,500 miles southwest of Hawaii. In the spirit of Christmas, the aircrew gathered some items they had on the plane, attached the bundle of supplies to a parachute and dropped it to the islanders below, giving the operation its name. At the time, the island had no electricity or running water and was periodically hit by typhoons. While certainly meant to be good deeds, the first Christmas drops that followed weren't exactly a success. Some containers fell into the water while others weren't discovered for months but the Air Force honed its skills and the program has continued to grow over the past seven decades. 
today, airdrop operations include more than 50 islands throughout the Pacific. Conducted from Guam, not the North Pole. While Santa's base of operations remains in the North Pole, Anderson Air Force Base, AFB Guam, has been the base camp to airlift donated goods to the islanders throughout Micronesia. Operation Christmas Drop is a PACAF event that includes a partnership between the 374th Airlift Wing, Yokota Air Base, Japan, the 36th Wing, Anderson Air Force Base, Guam, 734th Air Mobility Squadron, Anderson Air Force Base, and the 515th Air Mobility Operations Wing, Joint Base, Pearl Harbor, Hickam, Hawaii. The University of Guam and the Operation Christmas Drop private organisation which leads the fundraising and donations for the operation. C-130J Super Hercules Cruise Airdrop Food, Supplies, Educational Materials and Toys to Islanders throughout the Federated States of Micronesia and the Republic of Palau. These islands are some of the most remote locations on the globe, spanning a distance nearly as broad as the continental US. Though Santa can travel around the globe, the PACAF has proven also to be up to the challenge of reaching the far-flung islands. Still fairly low tech. Operation Christmas Drop relies on C-130J Super Hercules transport aircraft rather than a reindeer-powered sleigh. But the airlift operations remain rather low tech as air crews are linked to the village via ham radio as they fly overhead to drop supplies. On Christmas Eve, Brian Justin Jr. Whiskey Alpha 1 Zulu Mike Sierra operated his experimental station. Whiskey India 2, X-Ray Lima, Quebec, on 486 kHz AM for the Reginald Fessenden commemorative transmission. Another transmission will take place today, December 31, starting at approximately 2100 UTC and will run for 24 hours. All transmissions will only consist of the two Christmas songs claimed to have been played by Fessenden on his violin during his historic broadcast on Christmas Eve in 1906, as well as a brief Bible verse. WI2 XLQ's voice ID and transmission description will be broadcast via a computer-generated voice. The story of Fessenden's alleged first voice transmissions using an Alexanderson alternator on December 24 and December 31 in 1906 has never been proven to have taken place. While doubts remain such a transmission ever took place, Fessenden did perform some crude voice transmissions over a few miles distance in early December of that year near Washington, D.C. as a demonstration for the U.S. Navy. Fessenden is credited for his early pioneering work of human speech using RF rather than the typical spark-generated CW operations of the time. Longwire antennas with a simple, modern software-defined radio are recommended to copy WI2XLQ. SWL reports can be sent via email to WA1ZMS at ARRL.net and an email confirming the reports will follow. Audio samples of the reception are also welcomed at the same email address. To news from Region 3, China has released one of its space planes into the sky once again. The top-secret aircraft, dubbed Shenlong, was released December 14, but no one really knows why. It's the spaceship's third mission into space, and in regards to why it's up there, Chinese media have given quite a vague explanation. Amateur radio operator Daniel Estevez has since looked into the signal being emitted and says it's clear that it doesn't have much data in it, as per IFL science. What the signals contain remains unclear, but Tilly says that the mysterious objects seem to be the strongest signals while passing over North America. For VK1 WIA National News in Sydney, I'm Jason VK2LAW. We are VK1 WIA. Now, operational news with VK4 FUQ. Felix. Hello there. Now, contest wise 2024. ARRL Straight Key Night SKN is held January 1 from 0 hours UTC through to 23.59 hours UTC. Many of we hams look forward to SKN as one of the highlights of our operating year. Wireless men and women participate using Morse code. All you need is your favourite thread key or bug. 
many participants tend to dust off vintage radios and keys and put them back into service each year just for the fun of it during this event. All hand keys, regardless of age, are welcome. The number of contacts you make is not important. The reward is meeting new friends as you get together on the air. Ross Hull Memorial Contest, running on VHF and above for the month of January. For more information, visit the contest page at wia.org.au forward slash. January 2024, VHF UHF Summer Field Day, 13-14 January. Australia Day Contest. It is held on the Australia Day Public Holiday, 26th of January. Amateurs here in VK will endeavour to contact other amateurs around the world. Some VK operators will be using the AX prefix to celebrate Australia Day, as is wanted by many amateurs. Scoring is distance-based and calculated using four character grid squares. DX Window to the World, Switzerland. Special Event Station HB8 DELOY is QRV until the end of today. UTC Date Time. This outfit has been commemorating the first transatlantic contact that took place November 28, 1923, between stations 8AB and 1MO. QSL via HB9 ACA. Another cross the water commemorative station hails from right here in Australia. Members of the Wireless Institute of Australia are QRV as VK100ZL. Also until today's end to commemorate the first wireless contact 100 years ago between Australia and New Zealand. QSL via Bureau. Greece. Special event station. Call sign SZ65RAAG is QRV until today's end, December 31. To celebrate the 65th anniversary of the Radio Amateur Association of Greece. Activity has been heard on all bands using CW. SSB in various digital modes. QSL via LOTW. East Kiribati. Members of the Rebel DX group are QRVST 32TT from Christmas Island. IOTA OC024 until January 12. Kiridi Marti, Christmas Island time, is UTC plus 14. And it's a bit of a giggle when you look at how the old timers mapped out that time zone. Check out a map. Not to be confused with a couple of better known Christmas islands, this one, T32, is actually Kiridamati. A rather straightforward respelling of the English word Christmas in the Kiribati language. The isle has the greatest land area of any coral atoll in the world, about 388 square kilometres, and is part of Kiribati, a country encompassing 33 Pacific atolls and islands. OK, so that's your Geography Lesson class. T32TT is on 160 to 6 metres using CW, SSB, FT8 and FT4. QSL via OQRS. Morocco. Yannick, F6FYD, is QRV as CN2YD until March 15. OK, 2024 is just around the corner. I hope it's a good year for all. For VK1 WIA National News, I'm Felix VK for FUQ Inningham. From here, there and everywhere, you've tuned to the Wireless Institute of Australia's National News Service. We are VK1 WIA. Now, special interest group news with VK3 Triple F, Bruce. And a very good day to you and all the best for 2024. Worldwide Special Interest Group News, Astronomy, the 10-year amateur radio special event and countdown to the 100th anniversary of the discovery of Pluto will continue February 11th to 19th, 2024 UTC and celebrates Clyde Tombaugh's discovery from the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona of Pluto. Members of the Northern Arizona DX Association will operate from Lowell Observatory and their home stations using the special event call sign W7P. Worldwide Special Interest Group's Final Frontier. December 6th marked the 25th anniversary of the International Space Station. 
on December 6th, 1998, the first two elements of the station, Unity and Zaya, were mated by the crew of Space Shuttle Endeavour's STS-88 mission. Since then, 273 people from 21 countries have visited the station. Voyager 1 has stopped returning useful data to Earth due to a problem with the spacecraft's flight data system computers. It could take several weeks for engineers to develop a new plan to remedy the issue. Launched in 1977, the spacecraft and its twin Voyager 2 are the two longest operating spacecraft in history, behind AO7 that is. In addition, commands from mission controllers on Earth take 22.5 hours to reach Voyager 1, which is exploring the outer regions of our solar system more than 24 billion kilometres from Earth. That means the engineering team has to wait 45 hours to get a response from Voyager 1 and determine whether a command had the intended outcome. NASA's Mars rover Perseverance recently marked 1,000 sols, i.e. Martian days on the red planet, after landing at Jezero Crater on February the 18th, 2021. Its companion Mars helicopter, Ingenuity, the first robot ever to explore the skies of a world beyond Earth, made its 70th flight on Friday, December 22nd. And QRP satellite aloft. Hades-D satellite has been commissioned. After a trial period in which its behaviour has been tested at the radioelectric systems and energy performance levels, the FM repeater is left active for general use. At the request of AMSAT EA, AMSAT has designated Hades D as Spain Oscar 121, i.e. SO 121. The repeater works with FM FSK with an uplink frequency of 145.875 MHz and a downlink frequency of 436.6635 MHz. It is recommended to use narrowband FM. AMSAT EA is drafting a use and operation manual which will indicate in detail some of the characteristics of the satellite and its working modes. Although it's not definitive, AMSAT EA is considering some special operating options, such as reserving a day of the week exclusively for digital communications following the example we know with the AO-92 bird. Hades D is the first satellite with FM repeater service mounted on a pocket cube platform. This standard is the smallest in terms of normalised satellite sizes. Hades D size is 8 by 5 by 5 centimetres. Its panel surface and battery size are much smaller than the rest of the satellite repeaters in use. So, Hades D is not comparable to most of them, either in radiated power or signal strength. Hades D should be considered a QRP satellite. Worldwide Special Interest Groups, IOTA. In the world of IOTA DX, listen for 3B9AT from Rodriguez Island, IOTA number AF017, now until the 6th of January. Single sideband, CW and FT8 on 80 to 10 metres. See QRZ.com for QSL details. And listen for J8TT from St Vincent, IOTA number NA109 until the 5th of January. Single sideband, CW and digital modes on 40 to 6 metres. Again, see QRZ.com for QSL details. And PJ7 VA3 ITA from St. Martin, IOTA number NA105 until today, the 31st of December, on SSB and the digital modes on 40 to 10 metres. QSL via low TW only. Worldwide special interest groups, radio amateur old timers, and it's to our man in the West. Hello everyone, this is Clive VK6CSW, reminding you that in accordance with tradition, there is no radio amateurs old timers club broadcast in January. The first RAOTC bulletin for 2024 is scheduled for Monday, February the 5th. However, members and friends of the RAOTC in Perth 
A reminder that the first monthly lunchtime meeting for the new year will be held on Tuesday, January the 9th at the Woodbridge Hotel in East Guildford, starting at 11.30am. Everyone's welcome to join in and have an eyeball QSO. Full details are published on the RAOTC website at www.raotc.org.au under the subheading Luncheons. There's adequate car parking at the hotel, but if arriving by train, be sure to alight at Guildford East, repeat Guildford East Station. On behalf of the REOTC, I hope everyone had an enjoyable Christmas, and best wishes for a happy, healthy and safe New Year. 7-3 from Clive, VK6CSW. Thanks, Clive. And you too. Have a great 2024. Now, Worldwide Special Interest Groups, Radio Amateur Young Timers, Yota and Alec, VK2APC. Thank you, Bruce. The Intrepid DX Group has announced the winners of their fourth annual Youth Dream Rig Essay Contest. The first place winner is Abigail, KK7CFJ. In second place is Mackenzie, KO4GLN. And the third place winner is Cameron Frey, KD9VGV. The recipients' ages range from 11 to 19 years old. 30 essays were received from young amateurs in Canada and the US and the judges reported that each essay was unique in thought and very well written. Extra consideration was given to the essays with correct grammar, punctuation and spelling. The essays gave interesting perspectives on how to reach out and connect with us, we today's youth, and those ideas will be shared with subsequent postings. The Intrepid DX Group is a US-based non-profit organization that promotes amateur radio activities around the world. The Youth Dream Rig Essay Contest is designed to gather the views and ideas of young people involved in amateur radio. And as I leave you this week and year, a reminder youngsters on the air month is nearly at a close. This month has been filled with some brilliant activities from young people using special callsign GB23Yoda among many other Yoda suffix special event callsigns. Happy New Year to you. For WIA National News, I'm Alec, VK2APC in Sydney. Now back to you, Bruce. Thanks, Alec. And we thank everyone who's been involved, from those who have been supervising our young amateurs to those making contact on the air. Worldwide Special Interest Groups Video. NASA has released a three-minute video retrospective of its accomplishments in 2023. The video may be viewed at the link in this week's text edition of WIA National News. As NASA advances towards using laser light instead of radio to enable more rapid, efficient deep space communication, a Jet Propulsion Lab scientist's Tabby Cat helped prove that this option has real possibilities. A 15-second ultra-high definition video of the cat named Taters, was successfully beamed from NASA's Sykes spacecraft, travelling 30 million kilometres in less than two minutes to Caltech's Palomar Observatory. The images travelled at 267 megabits per second, the maximum rate to show that data can be sent from space at rates that are more than 100 times greater than radio systems now in use. Of course, no one asked for Taters' opinion about laser but the cat's feelings were evident from the video. The graphics contained in the images displayed included the cat's heart rate, colour and breed, while showing taters engaged in a favourite activity, chasing a beam of light from, what else, a red laser pointer. I'm Bruce, VK3 Triple F from sunny Bendigo. 2024, it's a date. VK3 Barg Hamfest, 4th of February. It's held next door to the Barg Club Rooms at Ballarat Airport, 10am on Feb 4. Redcliffe and District's Red Fest, April 6. In Bundaberg, it's the WIA AGM, May 4, 5. And Spark Rosebud Radio Fest, November 17, at the Eastbourne Primary School, Alambi Avenue, Rosebud. And finally, a final reminder. Actually, it's reminder number 13. To say, as of 2024, there will be no audio file with the numeral 32 in it. So again, if that's the file you used for any automated replay of this or Q News, change it pronto. I'm Graham VK4 BB. See you next year. This has been the Wireless Institute of Australia with the weekly news service. 
This broadcast is in text, audio and video and is accessed on wia.org.au. Courtesy of Bevan, VK5 BD's ATV and YouTube channel, this has been WIA National News. We're back now, live and local, and your voice, your callbacks. And don't forget, tick like. We have a big coronal hole, some dark regions on the sun's far side, and some aurora and meteors to ring in the new year. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week has definitely picked up an activity. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we've actually been watching quite a few solar storm launches. Not all that much, though, has been Earth-directed. In fact, back on the 24th, we saw this big filament erupt. Whoosh! That thing goes northward of Earth. This one here that we get a big filament eruption down in this region. Bam! Right there. You get that. That's going south of Earth. Then we go over to the east limb in a region that wasn't even in view yet. Bam! Fires another solar storm. Again, nothing is Earth-directed. Finally, we get a couple poofs here in mid-disc. These are finally launching Earth-directed mini solar storms, but they're really not all that big a deal. In fact, really where we're going to get some decent activity is from this finger-like coronal hole that's going to be rotating in through the Earth strike zone here over the next well, three days or so. The nice thing is that this is going to give us some potentially some aurora of over New Year's. And as we continue to watch this filament up here in the north, we're going to see it begin to destabilize. So this filament also looks like it could be launching as a solar storm. Likely this one is going to go northwest of Earth, but the tail end of it here might actually enhance that fast solar wind and the disturbance that we see at Earth. So either way, we're definitely going to get some aurora at Earth over New Year's, but whether or not it just bumps us to active conditions or possibly minor storm conditions could be enhanced by this region here. Either way, Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you're definitely going to get a show. And Aurora photographers at mid latitudes, well, hang on because we might get some good shows for you down there too. Now, switching to our far-sighted sun, we can no longer use Stereo A to get far-sighted images because Stereo A is looking at the front side of the sun just like we are. So we have to do simulated far-sighted sun images uh, using HMI and AIA imagery of about two weeks ago to kind of see what active regions might be lurking on the sun's far side and whether or not they're growing. In fact, as we watch these regions rotate across, this should be a cluster that's very familiar to you right now. Uh, region 3514, about two weeks ago, fired that big X-class flare as it began to leave the west limb of the sun. And as we pull up the JSOC HMI helioseismology far-sided viewer, you can see that cluster of regions here in the gray. This is the front side of the sun, but as they begin to rotate to the sun's far side, sure enough, you can see region 3514 that is beginning to grow continues to grow on the sun's far side you can see this big dark cluster in fact it also looks like region 3513 and possibly other regions as well are beginning to really grow so these regions are active on the sun's far side they're likely firing big solar flares we can't really tell of course but we have seen some big solar storm launches from the sun's far side and it's likely because of this cluster so amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect to get uh, radio blackouts to kind of rise again here over the next maybe three to four days as this cluster of regions rotates back into Earth view. And, amateur, and, and aurora photographers, well, we could definitely have some more solar storms being launched from this region. Also, as we take a look, we can see region 3519 and region 3527 also 
are growing on the sun's far side. You can see region 3519 here as it rotates across the disk two weeks ago. And then you can see region 3527 as it began to grow as it rotated to the sun's west limb. So these regions definitely are showing a little extra energy here and are definitely continuing to grow. So they may be ones to watch it well as well. So next week may be even a bigger show than what we have this week. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, and by the 6th, the moon will still be about 28% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like maybe some aurora on New Year's Eve, or possibly the peak of the quadrantids meteor shower on the 4th, you're going to have this bright companion, so you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Now, switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that fast solar wind from that coronal hole that's going to be rotating in through the Earth's strike zone. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting minor storm conditions right around the 1st with up to about a 50% chance of major storm conditions, and this could easily last through the first end of the second before things begin to calm down. Of course, we also have that potential filament eruption that could cause a little extra enhancement of, and, and possibly a longer period of time where we'd be seeing aurora. But this is good news for your war photographers at high latitudes. You definitely could get a show over the holiday. Now, at mid latitudes, well, we're only expecting active conditions, but we do have up to about a 20% chance of minor storm conditions on the first, possibly in to the second before things begin to settle down. Although, you know, at mid latitudes, if you're an aurora chaser, you better be dedicated to chase because the, uh, the shows may be a bit more fleeting at mid latitudes. Now, switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we do have a lot of active regions in Earth view, and this is why we are sitting with a solar flux staying around the mid 140s. This means good radio propagation on Earth's day side. And on top of that, we also have only minor noise on the bands right now. Now, this is only going to last for a few days until some of these bigger regions are going to rotate into Earth view in about three to four days. But that does mean that we are keeping our risk for radio blackouts reasonably low. NOAA is giving us about a 15% chance of R1 to R2 level radio blackouts over the next three days and only about a 1% chance of an R3 level radio blackout. That's very good. But expect again that that's going to, the noise is going to creep up, the solar flux is going to creep up, and the risk for radio blackouts is going to creep up as we crawl into the new year because of those new regions that we've are that we've been seeing growing on the sun's far side. They're likely big flare players and they are have a big possibility for big solar storms. Now, switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, everything is in the green this week. We are sitting at the D1 normal range for you aviators. This is at flight level 360. We're also sitting at the S0 quiet level. That's what it is for everyone else. And NOAA is only giving us about a 1% chance of an S1 to S2 radiation storm. And this is because most of the regions that we have in Earth view are pretty quiet. Now, granted, the risk for radiation storms will likely rise just a little bit as we move into the new year because of those new regions. But for all practical purposes over this week, everything should be in the clear. So you frequent flyers, and this includes air crew and high risk passengers, you're all in the green this week. So the space weather this week is definitely getting more active. We have a coronal hole that's going to be rotating in through the Earth strike zone and sending us some fast solar wind. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a decent aurora show over the New Year's uh, holiday. Plus, it might even continue through the second before things calm down. Aurora photographers at mid latitudes, well, it might be a little bit harder to get uh, long lasting shows, but if you're dedicated and you love the idea of getting nature's blessing to start off 2024, it's definitely worth a look. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, we don't have a lot of active regions in Earth view that are big flare players. So that means that the noise on the bands has gone down a bit. And it also means that we don't have the big risk for radio blackouts, but be aware that's only going to last for another maybe three to four days because we have those new regions that are going to rotate into Earth view and likely they're going to raise not just the solar flux, but also the noise on the bands and also the uh, risk for radio blackouts. Okay, so just deal with that and just enjoy the this little bit of quiet time while you have it. And now you GPS users, 
Well, you know, things aren't too bad for you right now. The solar flux is staying down a little bit and we don't have any big solar storms. We do have that fast solar wind that's going to be hitting in the next few days. So as long as you stay away from the dawn dust terminators and away from Aurora, your GPS uh, reception should be pretty good. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.